Welcome to Radiologist Headquarters. I'm Dr. Dan Koval, and it's time for five cases in five minutes, thoracic imaging number four. I'm going to show each unknown case slide for about 10 seconds, and then you can pause to study the images further if you'd like. I'll then review the findings, reveal the diagnosis, and move on to the next case. Ready? Let's go. Case one, chest x-ray history of breast cancer. Second slide, CT chest. All right, so looking at this chest x-ray, notice how there's this hazy opacity here in the perimediastinal right upper lung where the right upper lobe should be. Also, there's a, another clue to the diagnosis here. We have slight right hemidiaphragmatic elevation with a tiny peak. This is known as a juxtaphrenic peak, and these findings together we see in the setting of right upper lobe atelectasis. And notice how the lateral margin of this collapsed right upper lobe makes a faint reverse S contour. So this is known as the golden S sign in the setting of right upper lobe atelectasis. And whenever you see this, it's a clue to an underlying obstructing mass. It could be a primary bronchogenic carcinoma or metastatic disease causing lymphadenopathy. And in this case, this was a patient with breast cancer that had had previous breast surgery and now has metastatic disease to the mediastinum, as evidenced by these nodes in the right hilum, also some subcranial lymphadenopathy, and that's causing right upper lobe obstruction and subsequent complete collapse of that right upper lobe. So here you can see much more clearly the complete collapse of the right upper lobe, also with some mucus plugging within those distally obstructed bronchi. And there's that reverse S contour that we were seeing on chest X-ray. So this can also occur in the left upper lobe, but it's seen more commonly on the right. And again, it can be due to primary bronchogenic carcinoma, metastatic disease, or even a primary mediastinal tumor causing complete collapse of the right upper lobe. So look for that juxtaphrenic peak on chest X-ray, because that can be a clue that you're dealing with complete upper lobe atelectasis. All right, next case, slide one of three, history of cough, CT of the lower lung bases. Slide two of three, sagittal reformats of this region. Final slide, there's a 3D volume rendered reformat and also a coronal MIP. All right, so I give you a very non-specific history of cough, which that could be a history for any chest study, right? And notice how there's this left lower lobe consolidation. And you might want to just say, okay, it's pneumonia. We'll just do a follow-up to resolution. But this isn't going to resolve because if you look a bit more closely, you can see that there's actually blood supply coming from the aorta directly into this consolidated lung. So that's a little strange, right? So if we look at the sagittal reformat, you can see that even more clearly. There are two arterial branches coming directly off the aorta to give this area systemic arterial supply. And again, we see that consolidation there at the left lung base. And the 3D volume rendered image just shows a bit more nicely the anomalous arterial supply arising directly from that descending thoracic upper abdominal aorta to supply this left lower lobe consolidation. There again is that anomalous arterial systemic blood supply. So these findings are very specific for intralobar sequestration. Okay, now what's pulmonary sequestration? Well, there are intralobar and extralobar types, and they have some common features. They both have abnormal lung tissue, and this lung tissue has no connection to the tracheobronchial tree. That's an important feature. And they have systemic arterial supply as opposed to pulmonary arterial supply, and it's usually derived from the aorta, like in this case. And they're more common in the lower lobes, and even more specifically, the left lower lobe more common than the right lower lobe. So anytime you have left lower lobe consolidation, you should have this in the back of your mind. Could this be a pulmonary sequestration? So how do you differentiate between these two? Well, the intralobar type is more common. And strangely enough, it might actually be acquired. And it usually presents later in childhood or in adults, and often with recurrent infections, like in this case. And they usually have pulmonary venous drainage, but it may be aberrant. Now, the extra lobar type is less common, and that's truly congenital. And because of that, it presents in infants with respiratory distress or infection, and often as a mass. And it usually has systemic venous drainage, so it has systemic arterial supply and systemic venous drainage. And it has a separate pleural covering, so it's a completely separate area of abnormal lung. And it's often associated with other congenital anomalies, which is not as common with intralobar. And these are both uh, typically treated with surgical resection, although it may vary depending on the case. All right, next case, slide one of two, chest x-ray. Slide two of two, CT chest. 
Okay, so there's a lot going on in this chest x-ray. We have a cavity here in the right upper lobe with adjacent pleural parenchymal scarring. And then we have bronchiectasis in the mid lungs. Also some hazy opacity in the lower lungs here. Looking at the chest CT, we can see those cavities much more clearly in the right upper lobe and also in the superior segment right lower lobe. And then there's partial collapse of the right middle lobe here in the lingula, secondary to extensive underlying bronchiectasis. You can see this varicoid bronchiectatic dilatation of the airway here. And then finally, there are multiple areas of tree and bud nodularity, these little nodules indicating impacted distal bronchioles. So this pattern is fairly consistent with Mycobacterium avium complex, or MAC infection. And this is a non-tuberculous mycobacterial infection. We see this most commonly in patients who have some underlying pulmonary disease, but also in immunocompromised patients. So there are two major imaging appearances for MAC infection. So one is the fibrocavitary form, which we see more commonly in older men that have COPD. And that actually has an imaging appearance similar to reactivation TB. So you'll see these upper lobe cavities, scattered areas of tree bud nodularity, and then the apical pleural thickening, as well as satellite nodules. The other form is the bronchiectatic form, also known as Lady Windermere syndrome, which is typically an elderly woman who do not have COPD but may chronically suppress the cough reflex. And with that, we see bronchiectasis in the lingula and right middle lobe with extensive tree and bud nodularity. And then as you're probably figuring out, there's the mixed form, which has both the fibrocavitary and bronchiectatic form. And that's what we had in this case. So here's a close-up view of that right lower lobe tree and bud nodularity. You can see that the distal bronchioles are impacted this is nonspecific, and we can see this with infectious or inflammatory bronchiolitis, bronchopneumonia, or even aspiration. But it does indicate that there's a distal small airway impaction. And here we see the chest x-ray corresponding to this patient's coronal reformatted CT chest, nicely correlating that right upper lobe cavity, the right lower lobe tree and bud nodularity here as well, and then the bronchiectasis. All right, case four, history of asbestos exposure. Okay, so on the left-hand side, we have soft tissue images of the mid to upper lungs, and on the right, we have lung windows. And you can see there's extensive irregular pleural thickening throughout that entire right hemithorax, and this is typical for mesothelioma, especially with that history of asbestos exposure. So features of malignant pleural thickening, if you ever see nodular thickening, like in this case, that's concerning. If the thickness of the pleural thickening is greater than a centimeter in this direction, if it's circumferential, and also if it's abutting the mediastinal surface. So any of those features are suspicious, and unfortunately this patient has all of those features. So in addition to mesothelioma, other metastatic disease you might think of would be invasive thymoma causing this degree of pleural thickening. And when you have a history of asbestos exposure, not only would you look for mesothelioma, but these patients also have an increased risk for bronchogenic carcinoma. Asbestos-related pleural disease is often seen, and that can be asymptomatic, and that's just calcified pleural plaques noted bilaterally, which we do not see in this case. And then finally, these patients can get asbestosis, which is a chronic interstitial lung disease, usually presenting with the UIP pattern, the usual interstitial pneumonia pattern of chronic interstitial lung disease, but it will have band-like parenchymal opacities that extend to the pleural surface, and that can help you to differentiate this type of UIP from other forms. All right, last case, history of shortness of breath, coronal reformat. Slide two of two, axial images. Okay, so we're looking at a coronal reformatted view of the chest with lung windows, and notice how there's extensive, smooth interlobular septal thickening, and it's outlining the secondary pulmonary lobule. So all these little polygons are the secondary pulmonary lobule. And if you recall, the secondary pulmonary lobule is the smallest unit you can see on a chest CT. Centrally, this lobule will have the pulmonary artery in it, as well as the bronchial, and then peripherally you have the pulmonary veins and the lymphatics. So what can cause interlobular septal thickening? Well, if you remember, I gave you a handy mnemonic in a previous lecture, LISA. So lymphangenic carcinomatosis, that tends to be irregular, but it can also be smooth. Interstitial edema, which tends to be smooth. Sarcoidosis, which is usually a bit irregular and nodular. And then alveolar protonosis, or anything else that causes crazy paving. Now, if we look at the axial images here, you can see that, again, this interlobular septal thickening on the lung windows. Also, there's some hazy opacity throughout the lung parenchyma. Again, there are those interlobular areas of septal thickening. And then the soft tissue windows on the right here show that there are bilateral pleural effusions, right greater than left, as well as mild cardiomegaly. So these findings combined, this is congestive heart failure. So CHF is often a straightforward diagnosis on chest X-ray, 
But on chess CT, if you're not thinking about it, you may go down the path of thinking this is some obscure, acute, or chronic interstitial lung disease. So if you just think about the manifestations of CHF, this interlobular septal thickening is the pulmonary interstitial edema, the hazy opacity is the developing alveolar edema, and then we have the effusions in cardiomegaly. Also, you may have noticed that there is lipomatous hypertrophy of the interatrial septum here. We have this accumulation of fat at the atrial septum. And this is benign, but sometimes on PET-CT, this can have uptake due to the deposition of brown fat. And also, if this is large enough, it can mimic an atrial myxoma on an echocardiogram. And here's the patient's chest x-ray showing a more straightforward diagnosis of CHF. There's pulmonary interstitial edema, some mild pulmonary vascular congestion, as well as cardiomegaly. And if we compare that to the coronal reformatted image here, all these little peripheral linear areas of interlobular septal thickening correspond to curly B lines. So those are peripheral areas of interstitial edema. And curly A lines are seen more superiorly. You can remember A is above and B is below. And that's just due to interlobular septal thickening giving you this stepladder appearance at the subpleural peripheral margin. All right, we have reached the conclusion of five cases in five minutes, thoracic imaging number four. I hope you enjoyed this lecture, and if so, please subscribe to Radiologist Headquarters on Apple Podcasts and YouTube. It would be truly grand if you shared these lectures with even just one person or left a podcast review. You can also leave a comment or a question on YouTube, and I'll do my best to answer it. Visit us at radiologisthq.com for more info and to follow us on social media to get updates. Thanks, and have a great day.